Um, this morning, before we get started this morning, let me just say thank you um, to all you guys. And I know that there's a lot, of, uh, you know, in the last several weeks, there's many of you who have stepped up and you're doing a lot of things around our church that a lot of people don't see. And, uh, and I just want you to know that it, it's been noticed and it's been seen, and we appreciate you. So thank you for everything that you guys are doing and, and the way you're stepping up and the way you're encouraging me and Karen and, and not just your staff, but just loving on your church family. Um, your service really is important, and we're very thankful and very grateful uh, for you. So I just wanted you to hear that from me this morning and just say thank you. I really appreciate you, and I want you to know sometimes we, don't, we just wonder if people notice and see, and sometimes it's just good to be recognized, right? And so I just wanted to say thank you uh, for what you're doing. It's, it's been noticed and it's been seen, and, and Jesus sees your efforts too. Uh, he sees your efforts, and he's going to bless those. And so thank you for all that you're doing and you have been doing. Um, we're going to kind of continue. I, I don't really know if this is a series or not. I guess it is. I mean, we're kind of going through this card and we're looking at these statements uh, on the back of it. Love God, love his people, love his word, love his mission. And, and so today we're going to be on love his word. And we're not going to be in Psalm 119, 11. We're going to reference that in a moment. But uh, we're not going to be there. We're not going to be hunkering down there today. Uh, but over the last couple of weeks, we've looked at these statements and, uh, you know, love God. And we looked at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, which is, Probably a familiar verse of scripture for many of us in this room. Uh, in this scripture, Moses is carrying out the challenge that was given to him by God to teach the new generation of Israel how to love the Lord with all their heart, with all their mind, with all their soul, and with all their strength. And, um, and how they are to pass that on uh, to the generations that will follow. So this was kind of like the lesson plan, uh, if you will. This was the direction of how this would work and be done, um, and it would be done by diligent gospel teaching. You know, he says, teach this diligently to your children. Uh, so parents, mom and dad, uh, hear that. Teach these things diligently to your children. Uh, have intentional gospel conversations. You know, when we read through that scripture, it says, you know, when you're sitting in your home, when you're driving or walking by the way, you know, and have these conversations when you lie down, when you're at the table, just have these intentional conversations about the gospel we try to uh, you know if you're online if you're on if you're on social media if you'll if you're on our instagram pages or our facebook pages there's things we're posting about what we're doing on wednesday nights what we're doing on sundays and there's these you know here's the sunday school focus for today here's the topic that we're talking about for the month and and, and that's there so that you could spark conversations in your home when you're driving to school or when you're picking up from school or going out to have dinner or to the ball game or whatever those are there to spark those conversations. We, we put the, with the Wednesday night teaching focus on there. So you have that. So you're equipped to start those conversations in the car about just talking about what they learned at church the other night, you know, and, and uh, just reminding them. So diligent gospel teaching, intentional gospel conversations, uh, displayed gospel reminders. You know, one of the things we started when we, when we produced these cards, we just wanted to put these things where you could see them, you know, and put one in your car. Put one in your, in your bathroom at the home, maybe beside your bed, or just somewhere where you would see it on your refrigerator, somewhere you'd see it where if you were getting discouraged or a little bit anxious about what's happening in our church or what's happening in our world or in our community, you're just, you got these cars that just spark you to remind you to love God, love his people, love his word, his mission, and maybe go to those pieces of scripture and they'll settle your anxious heart um, in that. Um, so display gospel reminders. And then the last way, last thing was just living a missional lifestyle. You know, where in the Shema, where it says, you know, post these on the doorposts of your homes and, and everything. That's that's living a missional lifestyle to let people know that Jesus is the Savior of the world and the gospel, pushing the gospel out into those uh, into those spaces, being the salt and the light. And so we can conclude our time together that week with this statement that if you want to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength, to fill your life with the things that stir your affections for Jesus. You know, my encouragement was to fill your life with the things that stir your affections for Jesus. When, when God saved me at 17 years old, I was a part of a church. I, I had a deep, I, I think I've shared this before, so I won't go all depth into that, but I had a deep respect for Jesus. I had a deep respect for the church, but I didn't love Jesus. I didn't have a relationship with Jesus. I was, I was raised to, with a respect that I had there, but that there was no relationship. And when the Lord saved me, um, God did something to my heart. He gave me a new heart. He took out the heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh. And that heart of flesh was wanting to grow in faith. And I realized that the only place that was going to happen was in the local church. 
and I found myself paying attention for the first time to sermons and asking questions and, and being involved in, in reading my Bible and praying. And I really didn't know what I was doing at the time, um, but God was, was cultivating a heart inside of me that would grow to love him. And I'm very thankful for that. But I knew that the church was the place that, that was stirring my affections for Jesus, that that was the place where I was being fed and my soul was being, uh, my, my thirst was being quenched, was there. And so I encourage you guys to identify those resources and soak them in. Position yourself to follow, or excuse me, to allow these things to cultivate a heart that loves Jesus above all other, thing, all other things. And, and we just kind of listed out what a few of those things might be. Um, one uh, was his people, the church. God designed the local church. He put the local church together for our good. And, uh, and we talked about that just a little. We talked about that last week. We spent all of our time last week. We looked at 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, where Paul reminds us that we are many members of one body. We're many members of one body. And just as the human body is designed to work in concert with one another, the church is designed to operate in this way. Like we're many members, but we're one body. And this is what Paul was saying. This is, this is the excerpt of what Paul's writing in, the, in that letter. He says, the eye cannot say the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again to the head, to the feet, I have no need of you. And on the flip side of that, um, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. As it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he's chosen. So you're here by divine design. You are here, you are part of 12th Street by divine design. You have a place here. You're needed here. And I don't know who needs to hear that this morning, but you're important. Um, you may not feel like you're important. You may be that uh, ear that say, well, I'm not an eye. I can't sing. I can't do this. There's a reason you are here. You know, and I think I shared a story last week of one of my friends that broke my heart when she said, I, I can't sing. I can't teach. I really can't do anything but bring food. And I was like, no, 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 no. You have a, <laughs> you have, a, this is for y'all, ladies, all right? So um, you have a beautiful smile and a welcoming spirit. And people trust you. And people trust you. And people feel comfortable around you. That's huge. That is huge. And don't, don't undervalue that. There's a place for you here, and we need you here, and you have a purpose here. It's not just to bring food. It's, it's because your people trust you, and so you're here by divine design. You have a place here. You're needed here. So we love one another, right? We love one another. We encourage one another in good works. We encourage one another. We, we, we build one another up with our words and not tear down. Right, we build each other. Like, look, man, it's all right to complain. It's all right to, but like, let's not complain for the fact of just like tearing other people down. Let's let's say, hey, look, I've got issue here. I've got concern here. You know, and let's let's work through it together. Right? Let's let's build one another up and encourage one another and walk together by faith and and see what God will do with those things because I believe that's what God honors. Right? He honors a body that's working in concert with one another, not turning on itself and fighting against one another. Right? So. God honors that. And so we're going to take a look at two more things that God has given us to stir our affections towards Jesus, and that's his word. And we're going to talk about that today. And, uh, and, then, it, then, and then his mission, seeing people come to faith. And we're going to be there next week. Uh, but today we're going to be in, a, in, in John 15. And uh, we're going to be in John 15 this morning. So if you got your Bible, so I'll let you give you a second to turn there. But John 15 is where we're going to be. We're going to look at one verse uh this morning um, and that's verse five and um yeah so that's where we're going to be john 15 5 and what i don't want you to hear this morning is this um uh, read your bible in quote like I, I don't want you to hear that this morning okay um i don't want you to feel like this is a lecture uh you know if you're if your bible reading discipline is not uh, that sharp and that strong. I don't want you to hear for the next several minutes that I'm just up here telling you to read your Bible. Um, because I think most of us will probably just roll our eyes at that and kind of go, I get it. I know I should be doing it. I'm just not, you know, that's, 
And that's fine. Like, you know, yes, you should be reading your Bible. We're going to get into that. I hope this stirs your affections to do that. But nonetheless, um, I don't want us to think that it's just, okay, read my Bible. Um, you should, because you're not going to know Jesus outside of it. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a second. But I don't want you to just tune this out by saying, okay, this is a message about reading the Bible more. And it's not. Um, it's not. Um, John fifteen five. this is what it says. Jesus says, disciples, I am the vine, and you are the branches. If a man remains in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Uh, I first read that, or the first time I remember, or the first time I, I remember reading that, let me put it that way, the first time I actually remember reading that, um, was my freshman year of college, my first semester of my freshman year of college. Uh, like I said, Jesus rescued me from my sin when I was 17. I was a junior in high school at that time. And, um, and I go off to college, and once again, it was this idea of, like, I want to surround myself. I wasn't saying it this way because I wasn't this smart. I'm, probably, I'm not this smart now, but, uh, but I wasn't doing this intentionally. But I was wanting to position myself where my affections for Jesus would be stirred. Okay? And I was trying to identify at that time in my life the places that would do that. And like I said before, it was the church. So when I moved off to college, and uh, I left my church, right? So for the first time in my life, I had to find a church. And, um, and we had a, a BCM at my campus at University of Southern Mississippi. And uh, I thought, well, that's going to be the best place to go to find a church, right? I just go and hang out there and see, you know, where those guys go and where they could point me and everything else. So I get involved with the Baptist College Ministry team there, and uh, they're having this Bible study. And uh, I had never done a group Bible study before. Um, you know, I went to church on Wednesday night and Sunday mornings, and that was basically it. And so um, there, were, there was a group of students that were going to do this Bible study. Um, I, don't, I can't remember how many there was. There was only like seven of us that signed up to do it. Uh, we were all, uh, ended up all being freshmen. Um, we didn't know each other. I mean, everybody was, you know, so everybody was a stranger in there, and, um, and the Bible study was Experiencing God, right, by Henry Blackaby. Some of you may have gone through that uh, Bible study before, and you probably remember a whole lot more of it than I do. Um, I only remember three things from that Bible study, and all three of them happened in the very first week uh, in that study. So I couldn't tell you, I couldn't tell you how long it is, like 12 weeks or something like that. I couldn't even tell you what happened the next 12 weeks. Uh, I'll just remember that first week, um, these events, and but these things has stuck with me uh, since that time, and um, but I would say that was one of the most significant, these words that Jesus spoke in John 15, verse 5, are, are one of the most significant words in my life that Jesus has spoken uh, to me. This is a very special piece of scripture uh, that I cling to quite often, um, but here's what I remember from experiencing God, uh, that Bible study. Uh, Henry Blackaby writes, find where God is at work and join him. <laughs> You know, find where God's at work and join him. And as a, as a, a college freshman uh, in his first year of school away from home, um, that, that was, you know, I was like, okay, that's what I'm trying to do. You know, like, that's trying to see where you work at in and, and here. And he, and he puts me, positioned me in this Bible study with these group of people. Um, and, and so I thought that was a good thing. And that was a thing that, that's kind of served me uh, since that time was... You know, wherever we've moved, Julie and I have moved to Kentucky, and we moved back to Mississippi, and we moved to Alabama, and, and we made a move here just recently, and, and every decision that we have made as a family has is, is been a result of that statement. Find where God is working and join Him there. Um, I didn't come to 12th Street just because I needed a job or I just wanted to come here because you guys were really cool. It was because I, I was told, and, and the, from the evidences I had, from the conversations I had with several people, that God was at work. And I wanted to link arms with a church where God was moving, and I wanted to join him there. Um, and that's every, every, you know, I tried to make that the deciding factor. Where is God moving, and where is God positioning us to move with him uh, and, and come alongside another group of people and advance the gospel together? So, so find where God is at work and join him. Uh, was one thing. The other thing was when we were praying. Um, so I don't know, you know, it was it was the mid-90s, I guess, when I was in college, uh, my freshman year. And 
Uh, so, you know, back in that day, they, we, we, usually we would hold hands when we pray. And if you didn't want to pray, like you would squeeze the hand of the person next to you so they knew you weren't going to say anything and they could start praying, you know, and just kind of that little awkward sort of deal. And, um, and so anyways, I remember what, one, after, one evening we were, we did that, well, excuse me, it was the first evening we were praying. And I think like, you know, once again, I'm a dude and um, I'm not that smart and I don't manage my time very well. Um, and so I, I, I probably had like a chemistry test or something that, like the next day. And I'm like, Lord, I need you to uh, download chapter 12 in my mind because I have not studied. I don't know anything tomorrow. I need you to, you know, you said that you can do all things. All things is possible through, you know, through you. So like I'm trusting that you're going to teach me chemistry as I sleep tonight. Uh, so I can pass tomorrow. That's a terrible study habit. So high school students, whatever, college is jack, don't, don't do that, buddy, okay? It doesn't work. All right, so, uh, but that was like my mindset was like, okay, just let me study so I don't flunk out and got to get back home and everything else. Um, but I remember praying, and I, I don't know, I don't know, if, I'm sure I said something about grades and, you know, the, just kind of the, the general stuff you say when you pray. But um, I remember when I got done, there was a girl beside me. Her name was Rebecca Johnson and, and these people that are in this group have all remained. We've all remained really close friends. This God really used this group big time in all of our lives. But I remember I was praying and I got done and Rebecca Johnson was next to me, and she said this one sentence prayer that when I got I, it's like I said once I'm going to tell it to you in just a minute. But uh, obviously it's stuck with me since that day. But I remember driving home that night, being so convicted, and the conversation I had with the Lord was so. Uh, convicting because her prayer was so challenging it was one sentence and all she said was after i got done praying amen she says lord give me a heart for lost people amen i didn't pray that way i didn't think that way and here's a 18 year old girl who is saying god i Break my heart for lost people. Motivate me to tell others about Jesus because they're lost. They don't know. And they're going to be eternally separated from him and they don't know it. Break my heart for the lost. Amen. And I remember driving home that night, or driving to my apartment that night, thinking, God, I don't pray that way. I don't think that way. God, I want you to change that. Please change that. Like that's the way I should think. That's the way we should think. And, uh, and the last thing, I'm, I'm going to leave you in a little suspense here because we're going to talk about it a little bit later. But there was a third thing that I remember that night that stuck with me. And, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in John 15, 5. So let's just look at this real quick. John 15, 5, once again, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. So let's look at this. Uh, this is one of Jesus's I am statements here. I am the vine. Jesus has said, has said you know, and, and there's other scriptures where he says uh, he is the, that Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Uh, he says, I am the door. He says, I am the good shepherd. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. And what, when Jesus is saying, making these statements, when he's making these I am statements, uh, this is what he is alluding to is this right here. Uh, I am these things, and you are not. I mean, that, that's what he's getting. That's the, that's the point he's making here. He's saying, I am these things, and you are not these things. So uh, you're not the way. You're not the truth. You're not the life. Right? I mean, and let's just think about it for a moment. When Jesus says these things, when he says, I am the, the when, like for example, when Jesus says, I am the truth, Jesus doesn't say, I am a truth. He doesn't say I'm telling the truth. He says, I am truth. Like, I am truth. You know, one of the things, I, one of our, one Wednesday night, we were talking about wisdom and everything else. And I said, you know, Jesus is wisdom. Like, he's not, he doesn't have, has wisdom. He doesn't possess wisdom. He is wisdom. Like, and that's, that's what he is. He is wisdom. So when we ask for wisdom, we're asking a person who is wisdom. We're not asking a person who's just really smart and really wise. Like, I mean, there's all individuals in our life that are super smart. I mean, I got a friend of mine who is, crazy intelligent you know and so i ask him questions and get his thoughts on things but he's not wisdom jesus is wisdom right he's the giver of wisdom 
so when we when we hear this, we need to think in, in that way. He's not a way, or he's not a truth, or he's not telling the truth. He's not just honest. He is truth, and that's who he is. Um, so he says, you're not the way. So he means you, you're not the way. You're not the truth. You're not the life. You're not the door. You're not the good shepherd. You're not the resurrection and the life. I am these things, Jesus says. I am these things. These things, uh, these, these are positions I hold. These are, these things are me. And now in John 15, he says, I am the vine. So when we, when we apply that on top of, when we apply that thinking on top of this piece of scripture, John 15, 5, when he says, I am the vine, it's because you can't be the vine. You're not the vine. You're a vine that doesn't bear fruit that pleases God. Apart from me, you are a vine that, but you're not, apart from me, you're not even, you're, you're a vine that doesn't bear fruit that pleases God. Even with me, you're not the vine. We're going to get to that in just a moment. But he says, you can't be the vine. You can't be the vine. So you're a vine that doesn't bear fruit that pleases God. And the imagery that we need to see here is this. You and I are a diseased vine apart from Christ. We're a diseased vine. And the fruit that we bear is disease. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 7. He says, so every healthy tree bears good fruit. But the diseased tree, it bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. So, what I tell students, we, there's, a, there's a, a fruit of the series, a fruit of the spirit series that I've gone through. And, and, and every time I, I allude back to this statement that Jesus makes, I, I want them to be really, I want them to understand this. I want you guys to understand too. He says, a healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit. And a diseased tree cannot bear good fruit. He doesn't say a bad tree will eventually get lucky every now and then and produce a good fruit. Like it's bad. No matter how good it may look on the outside, how shiny that may appear, inside it's rotten and diseased. And it's not good for anything. It's trash. He says, but a, a bad tree doesn't get a good fruit every now and then. He says it bears bad fruit. But on the flip side of that, he says, a healthy tree. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit. It bears good fruit. So follower of God, listen to me. You're a good tree. You're a good tree. And you cannot bear bad fruit because the Holy Spirit resides inside you. And what's produced by the Holy Spirit is good. It's good. But a bad tree doesn't have that in it. doesn't have that whole life source in him. The Holy Spirit is not in him. And the fruit of his life is contaminated and it's diseased. And so we as vines are diseased by our sin. And thus everything that we produce is contaminated by sin. And as much as we strive, and as much as we work, and as hard as we try to be moral and upright and be good people, we're going to fall short of that over and over and over and over again. And that's all of our life story. Right? There, there's no one righteous. There's no not one. For all of sin and for all of falling short of the glory of God. So, so, we, so I'm not picking on any one person in this room. Like, I'm, I'm talking to everybody. Like, I'm... I'm this is all of us, right? That's all of our life stories. And Jesus is saying to his disciples here, I am the vine, and I will do what you cannot. I will be what you cannot, and I will produce what you cannot. And so therefore, you are the branches. I am the vine. You are the branches, Jesus says. You are the branches that are extending from me the vine. You are the branches that's reaching into your communities, into your workplaces, your peer groups, your athletic teams, whoever else God has placed you and given you the favor of those people to be the salt of the earth in a city on a hill. You know, when I talk to students, I got to speak to the, the Gaston State volleyball team this past week. It was pretty cool. It was kind of unexpected. But um, I didn't say this to them necessarily, but when I talk to football teams, and I, because usually when I when we speak to football teams, there's usually a, two or three guys that are in my youth group that were there, and I would always tell them, uh, all my athletes, I tell them this: it's like God has shrunk the population of your school down to your team, to you know, I, you know, 50 guys or you know, 12 girls or whatever, whatever, whatever you're doing, you know, volleyball or cheerleading or whatever. Like God has shrunk the population of your school there, and He's given you a skill and a talent to be a part of that team. 
and you get to be the light there. So don't waste the opportunity. Take advantage of it. He's given you the favor of that small group of people so you can bring the gospel into that position. Don't waste it. Don't waste it. And yesterday, for example, I went to I, I went to the bike shop. I went to a bike shop yesterday and started talking to one of the guys there that runs it. And he was telling me about the high school mountain biking league that they have here in town and 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 how to get involved with those guys. And he was telling me at the times they go when they ride and they do practices and stuff like this. And he was telling me about the all you know. He's giving me all these like stats. I can't remember what they all were, but he's like, there's X amount of people that come and do this. And there's X amount of people. That this. And we just love, man. If you want to get involved, man, we love to have you get involved. And I was like, yes, Lord, yes, I want to get involved in that. Like. Lord, use my love and my passion for cycling to advance your gospel. You did it in Sylacauga. That was where, you know, when I when I moved to Sylacauga, I, I got really convicted. I was like, Lord, I don't know anybody outside the walls of this church. Like, I don't know anybody that's not connected to our church somehow. And that's got to change. You didn't bring me here to be uh, a, a minister of this church. I mean, you did, I guess, but in one sense. But I was like, you brought me to be a minister to this community. So how am I going to be a minister of this community if all I do is sit here in the church? But I don't know anybody. So, God, what, how am I going to meet people? And the Lord used my love for cycling to introduce me to people in our community that didn't know Jesus. Some of them didn't know Jesus. But I got to walk through uh, this, you know, crises with some of these folks, loss of people, loss of loved ones with some of these folks. And, and, and some of these guys become some of my very dearest friends. Um, and I'm so grateful for that. But they also the Lord opened the door and gave me the favor of those people so that I could share the gospel. And that's a big thing. So we need to take our loves. I I'm often tell people this too. Like if you have a hobby, if you have something that you love to do, don't think that's a selfish thing. That probably has a missional, well, it's not probably, it has a missional intent behind it. So if you're passionate about golf or you're passionate about football or you're passionate about cheerleading or you're passionate about gardening or whatever, there's probably a missional motive there that why God gave that to you. And so it's our responsibility to steward that gift well by using it to advance his kingdom. In some way, shape, or form. Now, you've given me this love, this thing that I enjoy, so what do I do with it to honor you? And so, so let's insert what we learned last week here. You're a member of the body, the church globally and locally. You're a branch that has a unique and intentional purpose in the church that God has placed you in. Acts 17. Paul is teaching in Athens, and he shares with them this. He says, uh, and he, speaking of God, and, and God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined the allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. He says, the Lord has determined the allotted periods, the length of time that these people would be there, and he's also determined the boundaries of their dwelling place, just exactly how far they will go, right? So, um, um, I'll just be honest with you, I never dreamed in my entire life i'd be living in south side alabama had no idea south side alabama ever even existed you know i mean i think birmingham montgomery and mobile were the three and huntsville probably the four cities i realized were in the state of alabama especially when he moved me to silicaga i was like what in the world is that you know so like um i don't know what our boundaries look like you know for some of us in this room god may have you appointed to go and live in um Malaysia, for all I know, you know, and, and some of you may have the opportunity to take the gospel to foreign shores on short term mission trips. You know, some of you may never leave Etowah County. I don't know. I don't know what the boundaries that God has. But get this. God has set the boundaries. He has stretched you. So as as him being the vine and us being the branches, we are he is pushing us out and he's stretching us exactly where he wants us to go and exactly how far. And he's determined it. Right. And so. Um. So he's determined the growth of the branch and the reach of the branch. But he also prunes the branches that bear fruit. We didn't read this verse, but verse 2, we're going to we see this happening. He also prunes the branches that bear fruit. But why? He, he prunes those branches so they can bear more fruit. And we're not going to spend a lot of time here, but what you can take away from this statement is this. Fruitless branches are destroyed, but fruitful branches are disciplined. Fruitless branches are destroyed, 
but fruitful branches are disciplined. So the branch that is growing, the branch that is reaching further, it becomes stronger. It's bearing fruit and it's pruned again. And it goes through that life cycle. It goes through that process. It grows, it gets strong, and then it's pruned. And then it grows, and it gets stronger, and then it's pruned. And God's doing this. So what Jesus is doing here is that Jesus is exposing the errors of our life that tend to result in pride, disobedience, idolatry. And he's doing this as the vine so the branch becomes stronger, further reaching into its surrounding environment, and continuing to produce fruit. So when God is disciplining us, when God is, is correcting us, when God is, when Jesus is exposing the areas of our lives that tend to result in these things, he's, he's trimming these back. He's exposing these things in our lives to make us look more like him, right? And to get us more like him. You know, it's not fun, right? I mean, no one wants to get cut. No one wants to bleed. Uh, no one wants to do that, goes through those things. But the Lord says, I'm doing this. That's for your good. You, you are a branch. I'm not cutting you off. I'm pruning. And this is for your good. And this is for my glory. Like 10 years ago, it's coming up on my 10 year anniversary when I got hit by a car, right? And, I, you know, it's a, I'll tell you all that story another time. There's two versions of that. There's the Julie side and there's my side. My side's a lot more forgiving towards me. Julie's side's a lot more not forgiving of me. But nonetheless, I'll get to that. You, you'll hear that story at some point in time, uh, I'm sure. But I was hit by a car 10 years ago. And I remember going through that. And, 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 and it was pretty serious, I guess, at some point. I spent like two and a half weeks, three weeks in the hospital. Um, but I remember thinking while I was sitting in that hospital, going, what in the world is happening? Like, why is this? Why am I in here? And I remember the Lord correcting my thinking. Uh, I spent about a year of my life. It was a, a, a race. I was racing bicycles at that time. And I was uh, preparing for a race that I did. Uh, the pre I got hit in October, so this was the previous October, and I remember I didn't necessarily win anything in that race, but I remember seeing the times, and I was like, I can get to those times. I can I can get to those times. So I spent the entire year training for that one race, and I'm talking when I mean training, I mean I was getting up at like two eight three a.m. in the morning, riding my bike in the early in the morning, getting home, taking the kids to school, going to work. At lunch, I would go ride a couple more miles, and I would come back to work. And then I'd pick the kids up, and they would put them in bed, and I'd get back on my bike, and I'd ride again. So I was putting in something like 30 to 40 miles, four to five days a week on the bike. I was running three miles just about every other day at the same time. I was watching what I was eating. I was completely focused on killing it in this mountain bike race. Three weeks before the mountain bike race, I get hit by a car, okay? And I am sitting in the hospital arguing with the doctor saying, no, you don't understand. Like, I can't you got to let me out because I've got to, I've got to, he's like, dude, you're not doing this. I'm like, I've got to, you don't understand. The last year of my life has been all been focused to this point and I'm not about to let a stupid Monte Carlo ruin that. You know, right, right now, I was like, I'm getting it. He's like, you don't have a bike anymore. I will find another bike. Like I can get that there, you know, and he's like, no. So anyways, all that long story, I, but getting back to this, I remember the Lord correcting my thinking and I remember sitting there in the bed by myself in that hospital and I remember Paul's words that he wrote where he said physical training is of some value some, some physical training is of some value but training but there's there's an eternal value in in godliness to train yourself up in godliness You've been so focused this last year. And, and the Lord, I just believe it, man. The Lord sent that car to collide into me to make me stop. And Lord strapped me to a hospital bed to, to tell me that. It wasn't fun. Six months followed of, 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 of rehab and everything else, I guess, when I put it. You know, um, it wasn't fun. But, man, I, that turned into an idol. I mean, I was going to put it out there. It was an idol of mine. I, my whole week was looked at was scheduled around my kids and Julie's schedule and the weather. I mean, that, that was what it was all about. And so it's crazy. So the Lord prunes, right? He prunes to make us more like him because this thing in your life does not honor him and it doesn't make you look more like him. So he's going to prune us so that we continue to produce fruit and we continue to grow and look more like him. So what is the fruit that Jesus is referring to here? Um, 
does it mean we're going to have the awesome careers and we're never going to get sick and that everyone's going to love us? Um, is that the kind of fruit that we can expect as Christians? And we all know the answer to that. It's no, right? I mean, we don't believe that, that mess. We don't believe in this, um, you know, health, wealth, and prosperity gospel stuff. And he says it's going to look like this in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit. And what I want us to notice here is that he says it's the fruit of the Spirit. He doesn't say it's the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, this is a singular thing. It's not a plural thing. Uh, it's the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And he, and he says that because, because that he is what we could not be, that he's the vine, he's what we could not be, he's pruning us so that we can grow in these areas. And once again, I want to bring you back to the body. It's not fruits of the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's singular. It's not plural. And the reason this is singular and not plural is because if you if you take any one of these out and make it singular, it reveals that it's a counterfeit fruit. It's a counterfeit fruit. So, for example, like if you lack love, then you probably are not walking in really in any real joy. If you lack joy, you're probably lacking in kindness. And if you lack kindness, you probably aren't walking in a lot of goodness. And if you lack goodness, you're probably not faithful. And if you lack faithfulness, you're probably not gentle. So this is a fruit that goes symmetrically over time. It's not, you're not going to grow in one and, and miss out on the other. It's not, that's not it. Like, you, you, you know, a banana is yellow, right? And when you peel it open, it's kind of a, a little bit lighter shape. It's not purple, right? I mean, we wouldn't eat that. Because that's not, it looks like a banana, but it's not a banana. Like, it's not right, right? So, so it's the same thing with the fruit of the Spirit. You're not going to have these things and all of a sudden lack love. It's not the fruit of the Spirit. Love's got to be there, right? So it's a counterfeit fruit. And so, therefore, the Lord in his kindness prunes that we might grow in these areas. So, so here's the question. What does it look like to abide in Christ? I mean, this is important, right? I mean, if we, want to, if we want Jesus to abide in us, and that happens when we abide in him, then we, want, we should want to get this, get this right. Like, we should read that and go, if a man abides in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit, right? So it's, it's this idea of, well, Lord, if I'll abide in you, then you will abide in me. So, so how do we get this right? And Jesus says this to his disciples. If you keep my commandments, later on in John 15, he says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. And listen to what the psalmist plea is on the 4 by 4 cards here. In Psalm 119, verse 11, he says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. My plan, my action plan, my battle plan, my game plan for not sinning against you, Lord, is storing your word up in my heart. It's protecting my heart there. Remember what I've shared with you for several weeks now. You'll never get to know Jesus outside of the Bible. God has given us his word to know him, and you're not going to know him in any other way. You're just not. There's no... Anyways, you're just not going to get to know them any other way. You're not. And any so-called faith that claims that they can teach you about God outside of the Bible is a demonic organization that you need to run away from as fast as you possibly can. Because it cannot be done outside of the Bible. And look, if you don't enjoy reading your Bible, maybe it's intimidating. Maybe it's just difficult for you to understand. Uh, look, I get it. All three of those were things and things I still continue to struggle with every day. Like, you're not looking at, I mean, right now you're looking at a person, there's no way, there's nobody else that, that hates reading as much as I do. Like, I hate it. I don't like reading at all. I, there's, you will never hear me say, you know, I just want to get a cup of coffee and a really good book. It's never going to happen. I spent, I spent the, the, most of my time in high school trying to figure out ways not to read something. Like, I mean, my English teacher, I was like, is there a movie? Like, you can't watch the movie, you'll miss out. Like, I don't care. I'll take the extra 10 points off if it just tells me what I need to know so I don't have to read the stupid book. I do not enjoy reading whatsoever. My wife, on the other hand, she'll read that Joker in an hour. Like, I'm like, you're crazy. Why? It's a waste of time. I don't understand why you want to read. Like, that, that doesn't make any sense to me. But nonetheless, if you love reading, that's great. We just, we just, we have different things we like. So, I, but I just don't like to read books. I don't enjoy it. You'll never hear me say those things. Um, I just don't like it. I'm sorry. I just don't like it. Um, and I'm definitely not going to make myself do it if I don't have to, right? Some days it's just intimidating. 
Somebody's listening to me. Maybe you feel like you don't remember what you've read or the size or the length of a book or a chapter in the Bible just overwhelms you. Maybe it's just the difficulty of understanding. Look, there's me too, man. There's days that I'll read scripture and I'll just spend my time thinking, what in the world is going on here? Like, I don't understand what's happening. Like, what in the world? Like, Leviticus. Okay, like, what? Oh, I, don't, I don't get it. Like, Lord, what, what is going on here? And look, and I'm saying this to you guys. I know we're laughing at it, and I'm, I'm trying to present this in a, in a little bit of a light way. But listen to me, guys. But I want you to hear me say this. It's okay. Like, you're not weird. Like, if you, if you identify with those things, I'm sharing those things with you so you can go, man, I'm not alone. Like, I didn't hear that when I was growing up. I, I felt like I was the odd man out. You know, I'd sit and people were like, oh, yeah, I love reading the Bible. I'm like, I don't, like, I don't like reading. Like, I mean, I love the Bible. I love God. I just don't like reading. You know I mean? I, I struggle with reading. I don't want to not read the Bible. Like, I want to get there. But I just don't have a love for reading. Um, and look, so I'm saying this to you. It doesn't mean you're not a Christian. It does, you're in good company because without the help of the Holy Spirit, none of us can understand the Scriptures, right? I mean, listen to Luke, what Luke records in Acts 8. He says, so Philip ran to the Ethiopian, and he heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked him, do you understand what you're reading? And this is what the Ethiopian said. How can I unless someone guides me? And the Ethiopian invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Man, God put people in my life. And I said, look, I read the Bible, and I don't understand what in the world is going on. I can't pronounce the names. I don't know what is happening. And I, usually I'm, I read six verses and i completely forget what it says when it says go back to this i'm like i don't even know what it's talking about and man i had men and women come alongside me and were patient with me and kind loving right we talked about last week love is patient and kind and they taught me how to read the bible and when they taught me to read the bible man i fell in love with it i didn't fall in love with reading Okay, let me tell you, I'm, I'm telling you, I, you will not see me reading a book. Like, I'm not getting out, like, you know, Charles Dickens' book and, like, you know, just, I hate reading. I don't like it. But I love reading the Bible. I love reading the Bible. I love it. And God put that in my heart. And I love reading books about the Bible. I love growing in my faith. And so, you will get there. We get there. People, God positions people in our life to do that. Look. Once I got over the fear of embarrassment and realized I didn't have to know it all, I really began to enjoy reading Scripture. And I found those people that wouldn't judge me for saying, can you help me? I don't get this. I'm struggling to understand this. And I began not only reading it, I began to love it. So, But the more that we do this, I want you to really hear what Jesus says. Whoever abides in me and I in you, if you abide in me, Jesus says, I will abide in you. If you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. If you come to me, I will not turn you away. If you, if, if I will not leave you, I will not forsake you. Look, guys, Jesus is setting up residence in me, and then I'm there. I'm not leaving is what he's saying. You want, to abide in, you, you, want me to abide in your, you want me to abide in your home? I'm there. If you want me to abide in your marriage, I'm there. If you want me to abide in your thoughts and your actions, I'm there. If you abide in me, I will abide in you. I am not turning you away. So listen to me, guys. If you feel like God has given up on you, like you're this huge disappointment and he's tired of leaving the 99 sheep in the open country to come and find you again. Or maybe you identify with the younger son in Luke 15. You believe that the father has given up on you, giving up on your homecoming, and he's gone back inside the house. He's no longer sitting on the front porch scanning the horizon for you. If that's where you find yourself let me tell you this don't believe that lie don't believe that lie I'll, I'll 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 shut it down this way god has put you here this morning your heart your mind and your soul can rest if you're weary and burdened jesus says come to me and i will give you rest that's an invitation from the savior not a threat and when jesus says abide in me and i will abide in you that's an invitation it's not a challenge it's not something that you have to complete. Jesus says, if you abide in me, if you draw near to me, I'm going to draw near to you. I'm not going to turn you away. I'm not going to shun you. If your desire is to abide in me, then come to me and I will give you rest. I'll, I'll take up residence there. He says, I'm inviting you to be a part of my life. And not only am I the life, I'm the way and the truth as well. And so really quickly, that last statement, apart from me, you can do nothing. So I told you there was three things I remember from that Bible study, right? There was... Uh, find out where God's at work and join him. It was Rebecca's prayer. Lord, give, my, give me a, a, a heart for the lost. And the third thing was this. I didn't know what in the world it meant to abide in him and him to abide in me. I didn't, know, I didn't know what the word meant. But I was like, okay, if I do this, he'll do this and I'll bear fruit. But this is what I could, this was really clear to me. Apart from me, 
you can do nothing. Apart from me, Brian, you can do nothing. Apart from me, 18-year-old college freshman, you can do nothing. Now, at 18 years old, I didn't know how much longer I would live. I probably thought I would live forever, you know, at that time, you know, young and stupid. But nonetheless, I was like, I'm probably going to be living for like 60, 70, 80-something years, you know. Like, okay, that's a long time. It's a long time. I don't want to do, I don't want to amount to nothing. I don't want to amount to nothing. So I don't want to be apart from you. So, Lord, if, if, if I abide in you and, and you're going to abide in me, then, then make my life about that. So God did that. And so this morning, I don't want you to hear, love his word as read his Bible. What I want you to hear when we say love his word is abide in Jesus. Abide in Jesus and dig into the word of God to know him. To abide in him because you will not abide in him in any other way you're not going to get it any other way so this morning as we move to a time of invitation i'm going to invite you to abide in jesus and to think on those things if you're a follower of god and listen if you're a follower of god and you struggle like me in those areas where you just you're just not a strong the discipline of reading the bible is just something that's lacking in your life okay it's just not there Man, let me tell you how to, let me, tell, let me, let me give you some encouragement there. You're not alone. You're not alone. And there's people who will love to help. And by help, I mean hold you accountable. That's why we have community groups. That's why we encourage small groups of people gathering together to go eat dinner and the fellowship, to do what we did last night at the trivia game, to laugh and just be silly with one another so we can, our walls can kind of come down and we can realize, man, I'm not alone. Like, you know, these folks may struggle. Uh, much as I did. We went on a marriage retreat one time. We talked about raising kids, and all these people were like, man, I am terrible at this. I'm like, hey, I am too. Like, all right, welcome to the club. You know, like, we were like, hey, I don't have to be perfect. You know, like, I can breathe around these people, right? And so if you're a follower of God, and you're like, man, I'm just not there. Like, listen, you're not alone. And, and there's people who would love to help and invite you. I'm so thankful that God positioned people in my life to do that very same thing. And so um, we're here to help you. We're here to love you. We're here to pray with you through that. But the Holy Spirit um, will, the Holy Spirit will will guide you, and will give you that love. Like I said, if you abide in me, Jesus says, I will abide in you. That's that's an invitation. That's an invitation. See it that way. Don't see it as a challenge. Don't see it as um, a threat. It's an invitation. If you abide in me, I will abide in you. Non-believer. This is how Jesus abides in you. you you admit that you're a sinner you admit that you need him and you surrender your life to him and he'll take up residence in your heart the bible says that if you confess your mouth that jesus is lord and you believe in your heart that god raised him from the dead you will be saved that's it there's no 12-step program there's no class there's no hoops to jump through it's it's confession and belief confession and belief and so this morning if you want to talk about what it's like to be what it what it how to become a christian what it's like to be a christian if you got questions it's about man you know you the junk in my life like let's talk man let, let, I'll, I'll you talk i'll listen like however however you want that narrative to go i'm willing to do that with you my phone number i've been sharing it the last several weeks it's on the screen i share that with you so that you can reach out to me at your convenience like hey can we do lunch this week absolutely we can do lunch and We'll, we'll do that, or we can go meet for breakfast, or we can have dinner, or we can just meet in my office, or whatever, but let's talk. Or we can start opening a conversation on, on, over the phone, like, hey, just be, check on me a couple times this week to see if I've read my Bible. Okay, cool, I'll do that. Like, hey, let's read some scripture together, you know, and just kind of hold each other accountable on, on that end. But, but reach out to me. If you've got questions, let's, let's open up that conversation and let's start talking, okay? But this morning, Chris is going to come up and lead us in a song. I'll be right down front. If you'd like me to pray with you over something, I'd be honored to do that. If you just want to come pray at the altar on your own and pray for our church or community, then please come and do that. Or pray right where you are. You don't have to come up here. Just pray where you are in your seat. But be praying for our church. Be praying for our community. Be praying for us as followers of God to abide in Jesus, to love God, love his people, love his word, and to love his mission. All right, I'm going to invite you guys to stand with me this morning. and.
I'll pray and Chris will lead us in song and you move as the Lord leads you. Jesus, I love you and Father, I'm so grateful for you and Lord, I'm so thankful for the promise that you say that if we abide in you, you will abide in us and Lord, I pray that we don't look at that as a works-based thing that if we stop abiding in you, you will stop abiding in us. God, that's not how it works. God, you are encouraging and inviting us, God, to to abide in you, to be in you, to be about you, Father, to think on the things that you think about, God, to be to stir our affections for you, to, to plant ourselves where our affections can be stirred for you, Father. And, and if we do those things, God, you will be there with us. And so, Lord, I pray that as the people of God, that is what we desire. We want you to abide in our marriages and in our homes and in our workplaces and in our thoughts and in our actions, God. And I pray we, we want that you to abide in our church and as we minister to our community. So, Lord, this morning I pray that you move. I pray that you move. Uh, Lord, we love you. And it's your name we pray. Amen. Thank you.